And now, he doesn't slice, he doesn't dice, he doesn't make Julian fries, but we think he's amazing. He's our own physicist on a stick, Professor Clint Spratt. Welcome to the wonders of physics. Now you've all heard of a quantum leap. <laughs> that wasn't a quantum leap. But today I would like to talk to you about things that are quantized. Because today we're going to talk about modern physics. Now in past years we've talked about classical physics. Classical physics is physics that was known about 100 years ago. Whereas modern physics are things that have occurred during the past century. Now there's some other important differences between classical physics and modern physics. Classical physics deals with things that are part of your everyday experience. You can see them with your eyes, you can feel them with your fingers, you can hear them with your ears, whereas modern physics deals with things that are outside of your everyday experience, either because they move very, very fast, or because they're extremely small, or because they're very, very hot, or very, very cold, or maybe very, very large. Now, the first thing I want to talk about with uh, modern physics is the fact that everything around us is made up of atoms. Even the air that you're breathing right now is made up of atoms of nitrogen and oxygen. These are gases, and atoms in a gas move around, much like I was moving on the pogo stick. And I can illustrate that with an apparatus over here that has a jar with some smoke in it. And I'm going to blow through this tube and put a little of that smoke under this microscope which is in turn connected to the television camera. And you'll see all these little dots. Uh, we have a laser beam reflecting off these tiny smoke particles. And the smoke particles are colliding with the molecules in the air that are moving very rapidly. And you see they move around. And that's what we call Brownian motion. And so all atoms are in motion. And this hopefully illustrates that. Now I want to illustrate the fact that atoms move in yet another way. I'm going to light in front of me something that we call a Meeker burner. It runs on natural gas, much like the natural gas that perhaps you have at home in your stove or maybe your furnace. And it gets quite hot. And I have here a tube that has something very interesting in it. It has a liquid metal. It's called mercury. You've probably heard of mercury. You have it in, a, in your thermometers at home. And it's very unusual because you know most metals are not liquids. But mercury is a liquid at room temperature. And sitting on top of the mercury are some glass beads. They're colored red. You probably can't see them from the back of the room. But they're really not moving. They're just floating on the top of the mercury. And I'm going to put this in the, bun in the meeker burner and heat up the mercury. Now, when you heat up mercury, the liquid changes into a gas. And uh, the mercury atoms, mercury as atoms go, is really a fairly heavy atom. And so when these atoms start moving around, they will collide with the glass beads, and you will begin to see the glass beads dance around inside the tube. And so this illustrates that the mercury atoms are in motion. And the hotter you make them, uh, the more rapidly they move. And also, the hotter we make it, the more of them we have, because the more of the mercury we evaporate. And so atoms are very important. Everything is made of atoms, and atoms move very rapidly. Now I want to illustrate this in a slightly different way. I'm going to turn on a light here, um, under which is a little gadget that we call a radiometer. Have any of you seen one of these somewhere? A lot of you have seen them. Uh, you see them a lot at gift shops and places like that. And you, it's a thing you can give to someone, and they can put it on their desk. And you notice when you shine a light on it, it goes around. I'd like to explain why that is. Inside of this little glass tube um, are some veins, some plates of metal which have, are painted black on one side and white on the other side. Now, you probably know that when you go out in the sunshine, if you're wearing dark clothes, you are warmer than if you wear light clothes. And the reason is dark colors absorb the energy from the sun, from the light of the sun, and it heats it up. Well, in this case, we heat up the black surface of the plate more than the white surface of the plate. And as a consequence, when the atoms in the air surrounding this plate collide with the plate, when they hit the black surface of the plate, they bounce off with a lot of energy, a lot of speed. 
because remember, the hotter something is, the faster it moves. Whereas the atoms which bounce off the, the white surface, uh, that surface is colder and they don't bounce off so fast. And so we make like a little rocket and the whole thing goes round and round. And this illustrates an important property of light. In fact, that uh, um, light can make things hot and you all know that from going out in the sun. Now speaking of heat, I want to show you an example of something that gets hot. Over here, we have a heater. It's a coil of wire which is uh, plugged under the wall back here and I'm going to turn it on and you will notice, those of you on this side of the room who can see it, that after a while it will start to glow red. Now some of you may have a heater like this at home. Um, you frequently find them in homes. It's a little like the burner on, if you have an electric stove at home. It works on the same principle. We pass an electric current through it and it gets hot. Now this particular heater is at the focal point of what we call a parabolic mirror. And that mirror takes that heat and it focuses it. And the heat goes through this space here and you notice down here is another similar parabolic mirror. Now those of you on that side of the room have an advantage because you, can you see what's right at the focal point of this parabolic mirror? What do you see? A little hard to see from the back I know but in fact it's a match. And the head of that match is right at the focal point of that parabolic mirror. Now if someone hasn't bumped the apparatus uh, since we set it up about an hour ago, hopefully the heat from that lamp will be focused on the head of that match and it will get hotter and hotter and eventually it will burst into flames. We'll see. So just keep your eye on that and if it bursts into flames, uh, tell me so that I don't miss it. Okay, now while we're waiting, I want to point out what is happening here. Whenever atoms are in motion, they make heat. And in fact, this kind of heat is a form of radiation. In fact, this is called electromagnetic radiation. Now there are many kinds of electromagnetic radiation that we'll be talking about today. Very good. For those of you over here that can't see, we lit the match. Now this particular kind of electromagnetic radiation, we give a special name to. We call it infrared radiation. You'll see in a moment why we call it that. But you can focus it just like you focus light with mirrors. And by the way, the heat is moving across the room here. And so when I stand here, all of that heat is going through my body. But it's spread out over an area about like that. I feel warm when I stand here, but I'm not going to catch on fire. At least I never have. But by focusing it on the head of the match, we can concentrate the heat and make the match burst into flames. So that's infrared radiation. Now as I said, there are many kinds of electromagnetic radiation and I want to show you another kind over here. This is nothing more than an ordinary light bulb. It's about a 500 watt light bulb. But it's a little different from the light bulbs perhaps you have at home because it's clear so you can see what's inside. Most of the light bulbs you have at home you know are coated on the inside so all you see is the, is the white paint that's on the inside. But here you can see inside this light bulb is what we call a filament. And if I turn the electric current on, you see the filament glows, just like uh, it glowed down there when we passed the electric current through it. And uh, it glows in any light bulb when you turn it on. But I want you to look rather carefully at this because I want you to notice something that maybe you've never noticed or maybe never thought about before. And that is I have this light bulb on one of these, it's called a variac, which can turn it up and down. And maybe you have a dimmer like that at home on some of your lights. And as you know, when you turn it up, it gets nice and bright. And in fact, it gets quite white. But now I want to turn it down because I want you to notice something. I want you to notice that not only is it dimmer, but it's also very red in color. You've probably noticed that before. And you know that even before it gives off much light, it's giving off a fair amount of heat. So if you came up here like I am and put your hand there, you would feel a lot of heat coming off that lamp. And that, in fact, is infrared radiation, the same stuff that we got off our heater down here. And so a light bulb produces not only visible light, but it produces infrared radiation. Now let me illustrate this in another way. You probably have all heard that white light is made up of all the colors of the rainbow. Well, over here we have a slide projector, uh, the light from which goes through a prism, a triangular piece of glass. And we're going to project it on a screen on the wall. And it will show you, indeed, a very beautiful rainbow. Now you've probably all seen rainbows. This is a particularly nice one. And I want to point out that it's made up of all the different colors that you can see. These are examples of visible light. Now, also on the wall there is infrared. 
You can't see it, but below the red, there is heat. If one were to go up there with some kind of detector that was sensitive to infrared radiation and held it just below the red part that you could see, it would get warm because that's where heat comes from. Heat is a part of the electromagnetic spectrum that is beyond the red end. Now this slide projector is also connected to one of these variacs, and I want to turn it down just as I did the other light because I want to point out that when it's not on very bright, pretty much all you see is the red, just as before. And then as we turn it on, you begin to see the yellow and the green, and finally the blue and the violet come in when it's very bright. So you can see that the brighter a source of light is, at first you're getting mostly infrared, and then a little bit of red, and then you start to get all of the other colors that mix together and eventually make white light. Lest you think that all light is like that, that all light is made up of all of the different colors of the rainbow, I want to now show you some lights that are very different from the lights that I just showed you. And in order to do this, I want you to all find that little piece of plastic we gave you on the way in. And I want to tell you what it is. In fact, this little piece of plastic, as recent as um, 50 years ago, would have been very, very expensive to make. But, in fact, we can now make them cheaply enough that we can give you all one as a souvenir. This is something called a diffraction grating. And it's a particular kind of plastic that has scribed on it a bunch of lines that go up and down the long way. And they are very close together. They're so close together you can't see the lines with your eyes. It's as if someone took their fingernails and scratched down the, the length of it, except their fingernails are very, very close together and they had a thousand fingers. And so there are many, many lines scribed on this. Now, because the kinds of electromagnetic radiation that we've been talking about behave like waves, when those waves hit these uh, lines, they are reflected off the lines. And when you look over at an angle, you see light of a particular wavelength that is reflected at that angle. Now, I'm going to have you use this to do a couple of things. But first, I want to tell you how you use it. You put this up to your eye, very close to your eye, and you hold it so that it curves like this. See the idea? And then I'm going to turn some lights on over here, some special lights for you to look at. First, I'm going to turn on a light that's just like the 500 watt light that we had over there, except it has a vertical filament. And I want you to hold it up and look at that light. And so that you can see it a little bit better, I'm going to turn off the room lights. And if you notice out of the corner of your eye, to the right and to the left, you see a beautiful rainbow. And so this is exactly the same thing that we had projected on the wall a moment ago. It's a rainbow produced by white light, which, makes all, which consists of all the different colors. Now, lest you think all light is like that, I'm now going to turn on a light over here that, in fact, is a neon light. And you've probably all seen neon signs of one sort or another. So look at this through your diffraction grating. Now, if you look out the corner of your eye, you will see a number of different colors. You see a bright yellow and an orange and a red in particular. So neon does not have all the colors of the rainbow, but it has only certain colors. Here's what we call a mercury light. Remember mercury? We had an example of mercury a few moments ago. And if you look at that one, uh, you will again see a violet and a green and a kind of a yellow color. Now let me show you on the bottom a helium light. The helium light, you see, also has about four distinct colors. It has a blue and a green and a yellow and a red. Now my all-time favorite is the last one here, which in fact is a hydrogen light. Hydrogen is the simplest of all atoms. And if you look at that, you will notice just two lines, a kind of a bluish green and a very bright red. Now this was a great mystery to people 100 years ago. They understood how when you heated up a filament, like we've done in several cases here, it would give off all the different frequencies or wavelengths that make up light. But in fact, it was a mystery why certain things gave only particular colors. And the reason is that the energies of atoms is quantized. And there's that word that I used when I came in. Atoms can have any old amount of energy, but they can only have certain amounts of energy. And when an atom changes from one energy level to another, it gives off light of a particular color. 
And so the fact that many things have distinct colors like that is an indication of the quantization of energy in atoms, an idea that is very foreign to classical mechanics and that, in fact, requires um, the modern physics description. Just as there is light that we can't see because it's beyond the red, there's another kind of light that we can't see for quite the opposite reason. It's beyond the violet. You know what we call it? Very good. We call it ultraviolet. So we have infrared light that you can't see, and we have ultraviolet light that you can't see. And I have here an ultraviolet light. And I'm going to now plug it in, and we'll turn off the room lights again. Now you see it glowing a violet color, and the thing that you see is not ultraviolet. What you're seeing is visible light, uh, violet light, but there is also light that you don't see, the ultraviolet. And you see an interesting thing. I have here some pieces of chalk, and over here there's some rocks of various sorts. And you notice when the ultraviolet light strikes these various pieces of chalk, that they glow. And this is a process that we call fluorescence. And you notice many things exhibit fluorescence. In fact, even my shirt fluoresces. When ultraviolet light strikes many objects, they glow and they give off a light that you are able to see. And so uh, this process of fluorescence is uh, rather common in nature. There are many things that do this. But I want to talk for a minute about another closely related idea, and that's something called phosphorescence. Now, a phosphorescent material is much like a fluorescent material in that when light shines on it, it glows, except unlike a fluorescent material like the chalk, when the source of light, in this case ultraviolet, is removed, the glow doesn't stop instantly, but it continues glowing, sometimes for many hours. And the most familiar example of a phosphor is the numbers on the dial of, of your watch. If you have one of the old kind of analog watches that has uh, numbers on it, you may have noticed if, you, if you're out in the bright sunlight or in a brightly illuminated room like, like this, and then you go into a dark room, it will continue glowing, sometimes all night. So you can read your watch at night because of this property of phosphorescence. Now, I want to show you an unusual example of a phosphor. And for this, I need a volunteer. Who would help? Let's see. Lots of volunteers. How about you? <clears throat> Come down here. Turn around. Tell us your name. Sam. Sam? Yeah. Sam, do you like science? Mm -hmm. One of your best subjects, I hope? <laughs> well, you study hard, Sam. Maybe you can be a scientist when you're a little older. Now, Sam, what I'd like you to do is turn to your right, go over to my assistant, Mr. Thomas. Now, he will show you a metal plate that is colored red, and what he's going to ask you to do is just to jump up and hit that. Jump up nice and high. Hey, there you go. Good shot. Now, we'd like you to do that once more, except this time we're going to make you do it in the dark. Do you think you can do that? Okay. So we're going to turn off all the lights. <clears throat> and we have to get our phosphorescent screen ready. So this will take just a moment. And now, Sam, we're going to ask you one more time to jump up nice and high and give that plate a slap. Thank you, Sam. Take a souvenir for your trouble. Now, you notice that we made, we actually took a photograph of Sam. And that little metal plate was actually connected to a switch that was connected in turn to a flashbulb, just like on your camera. And uh, when he hit that switch, the flashbulb went off, and that exposed the phosphor sheet that we have here, except, of course, in the place where he was standing or actually jumping. We caught him in midair, uh, where it made a shadow. The phosphor was not exposed, and you noticed it continued to glow. And it will do so for 15 or 20 seconds, and you, you could see it slowly fading. And you've probably seen those in museums, uh, but perhaps uh, no one ever explained to you how it worked. A property of phosphorescence. Now, speaking of different kinds of light, I want to show you a very famous experiment that in many ways was a turning point in uh, physics because it was an important illustration that the ideas of classical physics are not sufficient to explain many things that occur in nature. And in order to do this, I'm going to take a cat's fur and a plastic rod, and I'm going to put some electric charge on it by rubbing the two together. And 
we have right here a device called an electroscope. And I'm going to put some electrons, some negative electric charges on this electroscope. I put a few more on. I want to get it good and charged. Now, it's a little hard for you to see from where you are. And so I'm going to turn off, I'm first going to turn on a spotlight here. And then we'll turn off the room lights. And I'm going to ask you to look at the shadow on the wall over to your right. And you see two um, things that are hanging down that are uh, separated out at an angle. And those are little gold foils uh, made out of a metal. And they're electrically charged. And they're hanging apart like that because charges of the same sign repel one another. So uh, that's what's happening. Now, according to classical physics, if we turn on a light nearby, as I'm doing here, and I'll try not to turn it up too bright so you can still see the shadow, classical physics would predict that the energy from that light should knock electrons off this plate that is connected to those leaves of foil. And uh, eventually, they should discharge and they should collapse. But in fact, that's not happening. And this was a great mystery to people why that was, because people understood that light is a kind of electromagnetic radiation that carries energy. After all, that's why we get warm when we stand out in the sunshine, because the energy of the sun is uh, transferring to us. And one would have expected that this energy would have been adequate to discharge the electroscope. But in fact, it's not happening. And no matter how bright I turn the light up or how long I leave it on, it will not discharge the electroscope. However, I have here another kind of light, which in fact is an ultraviolet light. That will take a moment to warm up. And I'm going to take this ultraviolet light once it warms up, and I'm going to shine it on the plate and see if it will eject electrons. So we'll turn this off, and we'll turn the ultraviolet light around. And it's still warming up, but I think you can see already the leaves are beginning to collapse. The angle between them is slowly decreasing. And this is very mysterious, because this ultraviolet light is only about 10 watts of light. Whereas the, light, the other light that I had, the white light, was in fact about 500 watts. And so even though it is less electric energy, uh, it nevertheless succeeds in discharging the electroscope. Now I want to show you one other kind of uh, electromagnetic radiation that you've probably all heard about. And I'll turn off the ultraviolet light now. And we'll charge the electroscope back up. I'll rub the cat's fur. And we'll charge it up again. And here we have another type of electromagnetic radiation that, in fact, is an X-ray source. Now, X-rays are um, like ultraviolet light. They are very short wavelength forms of electromagnetic radiation. And now I'm going to turn the X-rays on and see what happens. It instantly discharges the electroscope. And yet, the power of this X-ray source is roughly 10 thousandths of a watt, 1 one hundredth of a watt. So even the tiniest amount of x-rays uh, almost instantly discharges the electroscope. And the reason for this uh, was explained, in fact, by none other than Albert Einstein. You know, we mostly know Albert Einstein because of his theory of relativity. And that was a very important thing that he did. But you know, Albert Einstein won a Nobel Prize. And the Nobel Prize was for explaining this effect. It's called the photoelectric effect because he proposed that under many circumstances, light and other forms of electromagnetic radiation behaves not at all like a wave, but rather like a bunch of particles. It's like you go out in the rain, and the rain is falling on you, and there are a lot of little individual drops. And that's what he supposed light was behaving like, like a bunch of individual drops, which in fact are called photons. So a photon is a little bundle of light. And so light has this dual character, sometimes behaving like a wave, sometimes behaving like a particle. And it was Albert Einstein who explained this and got the Nobel Prize for it. And in many ways, it was sort of a turning point in physics, because it made people realize that there were many things in physics uh, that we're talking about today that, in fact, were not very well understood yet, that didn't behave as one would have expected. Now, I'd like to turn to the next area of physics, which is the physics of the nucleus. Now, you know, a lot of people confuse atomic physics and nuclear physics. Um, I get them mixed up. But they're all the different. Now what? Well, it's Albert Einstein. Oh, Professor Scott, please excuse me. 
I didn't mean to interrupt this. I, I'll, no, I'll go. No, I'll go. No, Dr. Einstein, please come in. No, no, really. I no, 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 you must come in. Are Although, you sure? Yes, this is such an honor. It's not an interruption? No, okay. Uh, thank you very much. What are you doing today? Please come in. Oh, we're speaking about modern physics. Oh, it, this is a very interesting area. Anything in particular? Yes, in fact, we have just mentioned the thing you won the Nobel Prize for. Oh, you know, this, this is very embarrassing. I would blush if I could. But you know, <laughs> uh, so, so you talked a little bit about the quantum mechanics, yes? Yes, I showed a quantum leap when I came in. A quantum leap is very good, no? <laughs> quantum leap is very difficult. I've never seen it done myself. <laughs> uh, can I say a little bit about the quantum mechanics? Oh, this would be such an honor. Please do. Uh, thank you very much. You know, I am not completely comfortable with quantum mechanics. Modern physics is a very interesting area, but I have always had a difficulty with quantum mechanics. And let me explain why. Every day you use physics. You use it all the time. You think that the laws of nature will be governed by deterministic laws. A deterministic law means if you throw a baseball, you can predict exactly where it is going to land. Quantum mechanics is strange. It says this is not true. Well, with the baseball it is true. But with little things it's not true. Instead of being governed by deterministic laws, it is governed by probabilistic laws, like the flip of a coin. Personally, I don't like this. It might be true. It seems to work very, very well. But somehow I don't like it at all. I like other areas of modern physics. And in fact, is it all right with you if I talk a little bit about relativity? Oh, it would be such an honor, please. Uh, relativity. This is, this is a subject very close to my heart. Is it okay with you if I talk a little bit? Yes. Sometimes Professor Sprott says I talk too much. You know, I don't <laughs> like to talk too much. Okay, let me talk a little bit about relativity. You all know relativity, right? You have brothers or sisters or mothers or fathers? <laughs> this, is, this is relativity. No, no, this is not relativity, actually. Relativity is very strange. Let us imagine, let us imagine we have Professor Sprott here, and we move him over here and attach a big rocket ship to his back. Okay? So here's Professor Sprott with a big rocket, and I give Tom a match, and Tom lights the match and lights the rocket, and Professor Sprott goes boom, zooming across the room very, very fast. Now, here is the strange thing. Well, first he has to have good brakes so that he doesn't hit the wall, but never mind that for a moment. You look at him, and, quant and relativity says that he appears very short. Now, that's strange enough as it is, but it gets even stranger. He looks at you, and you know what? The same thing. He sees you as very short. Very strange, but true. All right, before I, before I leave, maybe, would you do me a big favor? Yeah, what? Could I do an experiment for these people? I've always wanted to. You know, I was a theoretician. I mean, I am a theoretician. <laughs> I get a little confused. <laughs> was, am, it's all the same. And I've always wanted to do an experiment. Could I do an experiment? Oh, this would be an honor, please. This is going to be my honor, not his. Could I borrow from you, say, a hundred dollar bill? A hundred dollar bill? He's got to be kidding. You take plastic? Well, we could try, but no, I don't have my little machine with me. How about a thousand dollar bill? How about a five? Well, okay, a five dollar bill. You know, scientists don't have so much money. They work <laughs> on very small budgets sometimes. Okay, we have our five dollar bill. And it just so happens that I have with me some magic fluid. We put this five dollar bill in this fluid, and I'll add a little bit extra for good luck. And I'll leave this with you for a gift. Oh, thank you. Yeah, sure. And I just so happen to have a pair of tongs also. I always walk around with these things. You'll never know. Okay, so we get this money very wet. Oh, I also happen to have a lighter. Don't smoke, but the lighter is good. Okay, I've always wanted to have enough money to burn. Well, Professor Sprott's money I can burn. <laughs> Voila, flaming money. It's a wonderful thing. Oh, my goodness. Thank you very much. <laughs> Look at this. It burns and yet no damage at all. In fact, Professor Sprott, there's your five dollars back. Undamaged, because I don't want to get arrested. Uh, thank you very much. But before I go, let me tell you something. I don't like magic. Because magicians try not to tell you why things happen. Scientists try to explain why things happen. So I'm going to tell you very quickly now that this magic solution was not magic at all. Instead, it was a mixture of alcohol and water. 
alcohol burns at a very low temperature, and the water protects the paper. So I was able to burn the money without burning it. Well, let me say, I hope you all enjoy physics, and Professor Spot, thank you for inviting me in. Well, one never knows who will pop into these shows. So that's quite a treat to have a visit from Albert Einstein. Well, where were we? We were beginning to talk about the next area of modern physics, and that's what we call nuclear physics. Now, you know a lot of people confuse atomic physics and nuclear physics, but it's all the difference in the world. And let me see if I can explain. You know an atom is a very tiny thing. You can't see it under even very powerful microscopes, but suppose we could take an atom and blow it up as big as this room. The nucleus of that atom would be about the size of a tiny grain of sand. If I put it on the tip of my finger, I'd barely be able to see it with my eye. And yet that nucleus would have 99.9% .9 of the mass of, of the atom, and would also have 99.9% .9 of the energy of the atom. And that's why people are very interested in nuclear processes, because nuclear processes can release vast amounts of energy compared to atomic processes, which are the basis for all of chemistry. Now, let me show you a couple of examples of nuclear physics. And the first thing I want to do will require me to light this Meeker burner yet one more time. Natural gas. We will put a little stand on top of it. I'll take a beaker, a glass beaker. I'll put in this beaker a little bit of ordinary cooking oil. Not too much, just uh, cover the bottom. This, of course, is something you can do at home. I haven't used anything you don't have in your kitchen. This could be your stove, of course. And I want to put in this beaker a little bit of ordinary popcorn. Now, you may say, what does this have to do with nuclear physics? And I'm about to tell you. There are processes that occur in nuclei that we call natural radioactivity. There are many different kinds of nuclei that live for a long, long time without anything noticeable happening, and then all of a sudden in a flash, they convert themselves into something else and give off a whole lot of energy spontaneously. It's a little like popcorn popping, as we'll see in a moment. But while we're waiting for that to heat up, I want to show you a real example of radioactivity. And to illustrate this, we're going to use a device here that we call a Geiger counter. And I'm going to turn it on, and if you listen carefully, you will hear an occasional click. It sounds a little bit like popcorn popping, doesn't it? In fact, um, the reason this is clicking is because there's a device here called a Geiger tube. And a Geiger tube is sensitive to nuclear radiation of various kinds. And you may or may not realize that nuclear radiation is bombarding us all the time. Some comes from outer space, and we call it cosmic rays. Other radiation comes from the rocks and the ground. And uh, there is a lot of radiation around. And every second or so, a cosmic ray is going through every one of your bodies. And it's been doing that all the time. And so far as we know, it does you no harm. But natural radioactivity occurs rather seldom. And so we have some other sources here, more powerful sources of radioactivity. If I bring one of these up, a lot of people are scared of radioactivity. And there are reasons to be fearful of some things, like fire or heat, uh, electricity. Even a tall building can be very dangerous if you're not cautious. And so radioactivity is just another thing that has potential for good or for harm. Oh, starting to get our popcorn. Now, I hope you realize a similarity between the nuclear process over here and the popcorn popping over here. They are both examples of random processes. And in fact, this is the thing, this is the thing that disturbed Albert Einstein. He didn't like the idea that you can't predict when the corn is going to pop or when a particular radioactive nucleus is going to decay. But these are the similar kind of processes. In a radioactive nucleus, there is energy bound up in the nucleus, and every now and then it spontaneously releases that energy, uh, giving off radiation. In this case, there is energy locked up in the popcorn, and by heating it, we can cause that energy to be released in a spontaneous and apparently unpredictable manner. 
Except in some sense it is predictable. We know on the average how long it takes to cook the popcorn, but we can't predict looking at a particular grain of popcorn how long that particular one will take to pop. And so uh, it's a combination of predictab predictability and unpredictability. Now natural radioactivity is only one way in which nuclei can uh, release their energy. I want to show you another form that in fact is very important. And that's what we call a nuclear chain reactor. And to illustrate this, I need a volunteer. Who would like to help me with this? Let's see. Come on down here. Come right down here. Turn around and tell us your name. My name is Karen. Karen? Karen, have you ever been to a nuclear reactor? You know, we have some in Wisconsin. Maybe. Maybe? You're not sure. You know, we have one right here on the campus, in fact, over in the engineering department. Anyway, behind you here we have a model of a nuclear reactor. And in fact, what it is is 260 mousetraps. And they're all set. And on top of each mousetrap is a ping pong ball. And on top of this, we have two ping pong balls above a little trap door. And what we're going to ask you to do is to take this rope in one hand. And when I say I want you to pull very gently on the rope. Are you ready? Thank you, Karen. And it takes about a little over an hour to set all those mousetraps. So I hope you appreciate it. But you know, if one bombards nuclei together with even higher energies, not millions of volts, but billions of volts, then a very strange and interesting thing happens. Instead of the nuclei reacting, as they do here, new and interesting particles are produced. And this is the next area of modern physics that we call particle physics. Particle physics is the study of these strange and exotic particles, many of which live for only a very tiny fraction of a second. And they are produced when one bombards nuclei with extremely large energies. And machines like the superconducting supercollider that you may have heard about, now being built in Texas, is an example of a device that accelerates nuclei to these very, very high energies for looking at elementary particles. Now, we don't have any sources capable of, of making elementary particles here, but I do have an illustration of one of the ways in which we detect such elementary particles. And it's something called a cloud chamber. And I'm going to turn on a light, turn the television monitors back on, on the side of the room, and there will also be a monitor here, and we will shine it on this device, which is a, a round uh, dish filled with alcohol, much like the alcohol that uh, uh, Albert Einstein used earlier. And I'm going to turn out some of the lights so you can see it a little bit better, because I want you to notice that there's a little wire stuck out into here. And on the end of that wire is a radioactive source. It is producing radioactivity. And every now and then, you can see a little trail coming off of the end of that wire. And that's a trail of bubbles. It actually is causing the alcohol to boil and leaving behind a trail of bubbles indicating that particles have come off. And by deflecting those particles in magnetic fields, one can determine what kind of particles they are and how much energy they have and many interesting things about their properties. And so that's a cloud chamber. It's one of many ways that uh, uh, elementary particles are studied. But now what I'd like to do is to turn to the next area, which is called solid state physics, or sometimes it's called condensed matter physics. Now, most of the examples we've talked about consist of atoms which are free to move around, like the gas in this room. But in many cases, atoms are bound into the material that they're a part of. And I have a model here of a particular kind of substance that you're all very familiar with. In fact, I'll bet every one of you put some of this in your mouth today. It's, it's ordinary salt sodium chloride. And if one were able to magnify sodium chloride so you could see the individual atoms, it would be made up of sodium atoms, indicated here by red, and chlorine atoms, indicated by white. And they're arranged in this very regular fashion. And this is what we call a crystal. And many solids do this. They form crystals. And by studying the properties of atoms arranged in very regular arrays like that, one can discover many new interesting effects that have great practical importance. 
For example, all of modern electronics, radio, television, computers, all the things you take for granted these days are a result of understanding the properties of certain kinds of crystals that we call semiconductors. And it's because of the understanding of the physics of such devices that we have been able to make all of these marvelous uh, devices that are so important in our lives. But I want to show you another example. Many such materials have special properties when they're cooled down to very low temperatures. And I have here a device that we call a doer, which is really just a thermos bottle, and it have, has in it a substance that is very, very, very cold. How cold is it? Well, I'll tell you. This stuff is at a temperature of 321 degrees below zero Fahrenheit, or as we prefer to say in science, it's 196 degrees below zero Celsius. Or even differently, it's a mere 77 degrees above the absolute coldest that anything can be. And this is called liquid nitrogen. I'm going to pour a little of it out because I want you to see what it looks like. It looks a little bit like water. It's a clear liquid. It pours easily. But you notice it doesn't make things wet. When it hits the table, it instantly evaporates. And that's because, as you know, nitrogen is usually a gas. When you're breathing right now, you're breathing about 80% nitrogen. But if one takes nitrogen gas and cools it sufficiently, it becomes a liquid, as it does here. Now, there are many interesting things one can do with liquid nitrogen, and I want to do something using a little cylinder here made out of brass. Inside of that is a little stainless steel cup that I will dip down into the liquid nitrogen. What's happening? Someone said it's boiling. It's boiling because the cup is much hotter than the liquid nitrogen, and thus the cup causes the liquid nitrogen to boil. Now, if you notice, the boiling has stopped. There are no more bubbles coming up. And that's because the cup has been cooled down to the very low temperature of the liquid nitrogen. And it has a little liquid nitrogen in it. If I shake it, you see, it will spill. So I'm going to take this liquid nitrogen and lower it down into the cylinder, like so, trying not to spill it. And then I'm going to take a cork and hammer it on good and tight and shake it. The cork flew off, went all the way to the back of the room, and someone has a souvenir up there. And this is an opportunity to caution you that many of the things that I'm doing today are potentially dangerous. So don't try some of these things unless you do them with an adult or a teacher or someone who understands the scientific principles that are involved. We want you to experiment and to learn about things, but we don't want you to injure yourselves. Okay, so that's liquid nitrogen. Now. One of the things we can do with liquid nitrogen, I will show you now. And for this, I'm going to call your attention to the television monitors on the side and down in the front here, because I'm going to pour some of this liquid nitrogen into a little cavity that is on the top of a 4x4 four four piece of wood, which is supported on its end. And you see it bubbles away, because the wood, of course, is quite warm compared to the liquid nitrogen. And so it boils. And so I'm going to replace it by just uh, filling this every now and then, because what I would like to do is to cool down that black object in the middle. It looks like a little pill. It is a cylinder of a very peculiar kind of material that was only recently discovered. It's something called yttrium barium copper oxide. It's a long name, but it is a material that has a very unusual property. We call it a superconductor. What that means is it has no electrical resistance. As long as it is sufficiently cold, such as at the temperature of liquid nitrogen, it loses all of its electrical resistance. Now, objects which have no electrical resistance have many interesting properties. And one interesting property involves magnetism. Now, I have here a couple of very tiny magnets. And I'm going to pick one up in the tweezers. And I'll hold it here in front of the camera so you can see. It's a little tiny magnet. And I'm going to put this magnet on top of the yttrium barium copper oxide, assuming it has cooled down sufficiently. Right. You will notice that, in fact, it is magnetically levitated. It's suspended a small distance above the little cylinder of yttrium barium copper oxide. And it's also spinning around. The reason it spins, by the way, is a mystery. Uh, people are still debating why it does that. Now, I'd like to turn to the next area of physics which is, in fact, my favorite area. And that is plasma physics. And the reason it's my favorite is that that's the area I do my own research in. And so I have a very fine place in my heart for plasma physics, and I want to tell you a little bit about it.
Plasma is a material that is heated to extraordinarily high temperatures. So high a temperature that it is like a new state of matter. Now you've all heard of solids, liquids, and gases, right? Those are the three states of matter that you're all taught about. And most of the things around you is in one of those forms. And if you think about how you make a liquid out of a solid, you heat it. If you have ice, you add heat to it and it melts. It becomes liquid water. If you take liquid water, or any liquid, and add heat to it, it will become a gas. We call it steam. If you take a gas and continue heating it, it will transform into something called a plasma. And the difference between a plasma and an ordinary gas is that a plasma is a conductor of electricity, whereas an ordinary gas is not. Now, I want to show you an example of a plasma over here. I have a, a tube, a glass tube, which right now has air in it, and I just turned on a vacuum pump to take most of the air out of the tube. Because if we're going to heat something to these extremely high temperatures, thousands and sometimes even millions of degrees, uh, it is easiest if we don't have too much stuff to heat. So we often make plasmas out of things that are ordinarily considered pretty good vacuums. In fact, uh, plasmas fill all of outer space. In fact, it's been estimated that about 99.9% .9 of the universe is a plasma. And the Earth is an unusual place where matter exists in those other forms. All of the stars are big balls of plasma. And in fact, one of the interesting things that can happen with plasmas that are heated sufficiently hot is that they can release energy by a process that we call nuclear fusion. And people are now trying to understand how to make nuclear fusion reactors. Now we're going to apply a voltage of about 10,000 volts between the end of this tube. There. And I'll turn off the lights so you can see it a little bit better. And you'll see an example of what we call a discharge plasma, an electric discharge. Now I want to walk over to it with a magnet in my hand and show you what happens when we bring a magnet up near a plasma. You can see it affects the plasma. It makes it move around. And that's a very important property of plasmas because it means that by using magnetic fields, we can control what the plasmas are doing. And so uh, that is an area of intense research right now to try to use magnetic fields to confine plasmas for making controlled nuclear fusion reactors. Let me show you a couple of other examples of plasmas. I'll bet you've all seen something like these little gadgets here. And I'll turn off the lights so you can see them a little better. These are sold as pieces of art. You can buy them now for under $100. And they're very beautiful. But they are examples of plasmas. And you notice a peculiar thing. The one in the middle I've actually trained to respond to my voice and to the sound of the music. So you see, controlling plasmas is, is an important uh, science and in many ways an art as well. Now, another example of a plasma, plasmas um, are made by electric discharges of various sorts. And the next plasma I want to show you, we're going to make with a material that's very familiar to you all, I'm sure. Ordinary aluminum foil that I'm sure you all have in your kitchen. And we have cut off a strip of aluminum foil like this. And we have put it across here between two terminals that are connected to some wires that go back here to a device that we call a capacitor. A capacitor stores electric energy, much like the battery in your car. And I'm going to charge this capacitor up. But before I do that, I want to put on my safety glasses. And you're going to be safe because of this piece of plastic right here. And I'm going to charge the capacitor up to about 6,000 volts. And uh, here we're up to about 2,000. And then we're going to discharge it into that piece of wire. And as you see, Mr. Lovell has his fingers in his ears. And if loud noises bother you, you might want to put your fingers in your ears, too. It's going to make a certain amount of noise. Now, we're up to about 5,000 volts. Now, is everyone ready? Here we go. And in fact, we have, in this case, converted a solid into a plasma. A plasma is an electrically conducting gas. Now, you know, there are plasmas that you're all familiar with. And one example of a plasma that you've all seen is a bolt of lightning. And we have a device over here that, in fact, makes uh, things like bolts of lightning. They're not quite as dramatic as real lightning. But nevertheless, it makes very uh, large electric discharges. And for the next thing I want to do, I need someone to help me. Would someone volunteer? How about you? Come on down. 
Turn around. What's your name? Dominique. Mon Dominique. 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 Do you know much about electricity? It doesn't scare you, though, does it? Have you ever seen a big lightning storm? Does it scare you to be out in one? Not too much. Well, that's good. We'll see how you do this. Dominique, turn to your right and walk right over here. And what I would like you to do, Dominique, turn here. I would like you to have a seat in what looks... You volunteered. <laughs> have a seat in what looks very much like an electric chair. Now over to Dominique's right is a million volt Tesla coil. And we're going to turn this on. And Dominique, as long as you uh, don't stick your fingers through the cage, you will be perfectly safe. This won't hurt. You won't feel a thing. Thank you, Dominique. She looked a little scared there, but you didn't feel a thing, did you? Not a thing. In fact, believe it or not, she was actually safer than many of you because she was inside of what we call a Faraday cage, named after Michael Faraday, a famous physicist and chemist who lived some hundred years ago. And uh, Michael Faraday used to give public lectures very much like this. In fact, every Christmas, he would give lectures, especially for children, about science. And in a certain way, the lectures that you're hearing today are an outgrowth of that tradition that was started in, in England a um, hundred years ago or more. And I'm sure one of the things uh, Michael Faraday did was to put people inside of cages like this and make sparks uh, crash all around them. Now, the last thing I'd like to talk to you about today is what we call space physics. Now, space physics involves things that are very large, like the whole universe. Now, it's hard to do a demonstration here on the behavior of the universe, but I can show you an example of something that we know about the universe. And the example I want to show you involves an ordinary balloon, which is connected to an air hose, much like the kind of air hose you would use for pumping up the tires of your car or perhaps your bicycle. Now, as I begin to put air into it, the balloon, of course, will slowly expand. And you notice before I did this, I painted some things on here. They look like little spiders. But in fact, these are meant to represent galaxies. You know, we live in a galaxy. Do you know its name? Exactly. We live in the Milky Way galaxy. And so imagine that one of these is our galaxy. Take this one right here. Now, an interesting thing happens. If you look far out into space, you see a lot of other galaxies, thousands of them, in fact. And if you look at these galaxies, you notice they're all moving away from us. And the ones that are farthest away are moving the fastest. And that implies that the universe is expanding. And so it's a little like the balloon. If one takes two galaxies that are nearby, they are separating, but not very fast. They're separating rather slowly. But if one looks at two galaxies that, far, that are far apart, they're separating relatively fast. So the universe that we see, at least, seems to be expanding all the time. Now, this isn't a perfectly good model because, of course, in the real universe, the galaxies are throughout the interior. They're not all just on the surface, the way I've drawn here. So you have to use your imagination a little bit. And so the universe is expanding. And in fact, we don't know what ultimately will happen to the universe. We don't know whether it will continue expanding forever, or we don't know that perhaps it will reach some final size and then it will stop expanding, or perhaps it will stop expanding and then begin contracting again. We simply don't know. But one thing we are pretty sure of is that if the universe is now expanding, there was a time when it must have been much smaller than it is now. And in fact, we now believe that some 15 to 20 billion years ago, the universe was very much smaller than it is now. We don't know exactly how small, but it's perfectly conceivable that there was a time when the universe was small enough that you could hold it in your hand, if you can imagine. Of course, you really couldn't do that for many reasons. First of all, it would be much too heavy, right? All the mass in the present universe would have been in that little bit of space. Secondly, it would have been very hot. It would have burned your hand, so that wouldn't work. And thirdly, uh, of course, you wouldn't have been around to do it anyway. <laughs> but we believe that the universe started some 15 to 20 billion years ago in an enormous explosion, not unlike the one that I just showed, but, uh, but immensely more powerful. 
and that ever since it's been expanding. So this is truly remarkable that the universe has apparently evolved in that fashion. Now, you know, I'd like to leave you with one final thought. Many people think that science is a very hard subject. That there are many things to learn um, and that it's very difficult. But you know, the real mark of a scientist is not how much you know, but how good the questions are that you ask. Because there are many more things that we don't know the answers to than there are that we do. And what modern science is all about is trying to find out the answers to things we don't know. So this is something you can all participate in in some degree. You can all have this curiosity about the universe that surrounds you, and you can all ask questions and try to find out the answers. And the mark of a scientist is asking the right question and doing the right experiment to find out the answer. And I hope you all, whether you're a scientist or not, will try to participate in some degree in this exciting undertaking that's been going on for so long and may continue to go on for some time to come. So I'd like to close with one last demonstration. Traditionally, we have always concluded these shows by making a cloud using liquid nitrogen, the same stuff we have shown you before. This is a doer filled with liquid nitrogen. We pump compressed nitrogen gas into the doer. The nitrogen comes out through these holes in the top. The nitrogen, of course, is very cold, and it cools the air above. And the air, of course, has moisture in it, uh, uh, water in the gaseous state. And some of that gas will condense and form tiny little droplets of liquid water. And that's what we call a cloud. And that will be the conclusion. I'll put on my hat. And I will thank you all for coming.